It's a watershed moment for Afghanistan and for the Western world. With breathtaking speed, the Taliban swept across the country, meeting little resistance as they marched into Kabul to declare the dawn of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. As armed fighters took control of the streets of the capital, thousands fled to Kabul airport in a desperate attempt to flee the country, resulting in chaos and death on the runway. Western countries are scrambling to evacuate diplomats and local Afghan staff, a humiliating debacle for an alliance that had promised to bring freedom and democracy to a land that has known little but war for more than 40 years. Our title, Taliban Victory, A Return to Terror. Welcome to To The Point. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Jessica Berlin is founder of Construct, a strategic consultancy for sustainable business and policy innovation. She's worked for the US government and for German development cooperation in Afghanistan and says 20 years of war on terror in Afghanistan may have created more terrorists than it defeated. And Andrew Gilmore is with us. He heads the peace-building organization Berghoff Foundation, which has been working to promote dialogue between the different parties in Afghanistan. He believes the international community needs to talk with the Taliban and encourage positive behavior. A rejection of dialogue would be counterproductive. And it's a great pleasure to welcome once again Ahmed Wali Achatsiye. He's a colleague here at DW working in the Dari Pashtu department, and he's convinced the Taliban are fighters. They will fail in nation building. So welcome to all of you. And let me begin, uh, Wali, with you. You say the Taliban are fighters, and many military experts say that, in fact, over the years, they have dramatically improved their strategic and operational skills. Nonetheless, is this breathtakingly rapid takeover more a fruit of their strength or the government's weakness? I think both. Um, uh, uh, it is uh, really a surprise that in that speed they could uh, uh, overtake Kabul, uh, but uh, it was uh, something that was possible and it was made possible in uh, 2020 in February as the U.S. made that deal with Taliban and not letting the Afghan government uh, a part of that. So uh, uh, it is a surprise, uh, uh, but uh, it is uh, it, it could be seen um, uh, that it will happen. What conclusions do you draw from the speed uh, with which the uh, Afghan army forces laid down their arms? What does that tell us? It tells us that the Afghan soldiers, the policemen, and all Afghans are tired of war. They don't want war. And especially as uh, many of the um, Afghan soldiers think that the Taliban are not invaders, they are not outsiders. So they saw no clue why should they be fighting Taliban, especially if uh, 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 that they are earning 60 to 70 euros monthly. And uh, they may have asked themselves for what? For a democracy that is not a democracy and for the corrupt um, uh, uh, government. So uh, I think it was their right to decide so, and uh, we should respect that. And in fact, those 60 to 70 euros they were earning apparently were not even always paid to them. Jessica, the pictures from Kabul airport suggest that many people are terrified by the Taliban's return to power. On the other hand, while he was just talking about that war weariness, does that mitigate people's apprehension at all? What are you hearing from people, uh, friends, colleagues uh, in Afghanistan? Right now, people are terrified. There's no other word for it. I'm hearing every day from friends and former colleagues on the ground. They're in hiding. They don't know what's going to happen to them. They're scared sick for each other and for their families. And above all, with Kabul airport being effectively surrounded by the Taliban, they're not letting Afghan nationals through. People are desperate and there's an increasing sense of panic that the door is closing and they won't be able to get out.
The Taliban's first priority, though, in Kabul has been to establish order, to make sure that the police phone line was working, to prevent looting. Does that not raise any expectation that uh, they may moderate uh, their harsh behavior that, that we've known in the past? In this moment, no. The fact that they've taken a few videos um, of Taliban fighters um, stopping looters um, is not changing the reality that people remember what Taliban rule was like. And right now, they have no reason to believe that this time around, it'll be anything different. We've even just seen yesterday um, dramatic images from Jalalabad, where protesters went out in the streets to raise the Afghan national flag, to take down the Taliban flag. And what happened? There were shots fired, several people were killed, they were being beaten, and even civilians in Kabul, just trying to go to the airport, have also been shot at, have been beaten. So nobody is trusting um, the Taliban statements that they are, they've turned over a new leaf. Um, Andrew Gilmer, your opening statement said that the international community does uh, need to talk to the Taliban. And of course, uh, certainly the U.S. did so. Wally mentioned the Doha agreement uh, that the Trump administration signed uh, and that paved the way for what we're seeing now. Many people would say essentially the U.S. giving away the store. Does that agreement contain any provisions at all that could restrain the Taliban's behavior going forward? Well, yes, it is. Uh, it does. And I absolutely believe that it is the job of all of us in, in the international community. And you, you, took, you commented on the, the dialogue. I mean, I, I was 30 years in the UN and now with Berkhoff. And in both those organisations, it is founded on the, the importance of dialogue with all parties. And we have a very intensive dialogue with the Taliban and have done for, for many years. Um, I, I, and they make it's not just things that, that they've been signed that have signed up to in the Doha agreement, but also informal agreements. And I do think it is a, incumbent on all of us to, to hold them to their word. And I think that's what we, sh we, sh we should be doing. I think the, the great mistake would be to ostracize them. I mean, the, the loss of credibility is so dramatic on the part of the West. I mean, your, your first question to Wally was, was it the strength of the Taliban or the weakness of the um, government? And he said both. And I agree. But actually, the real reason for the collapse was the utter completeness and speed of the way that they were deserted by their US allies. And that is what is the key. And why did they lay down their weapons? The real reason for that, I think, because I was in, I was posted in Afghanistan in the early 90s when Kabul fell to the, to the Mujahideen. And for the first time, uh, and, a, and a rather progressive society inside Kabul was suddenly um, overcome and was occupied by very, very non-progressive uh, forces of Afghanistan in the Mujahideen. And, and what one learned from that crucial experience was that nobody is going to be the last person to, de to defend a government. And what Najibullah had done in March 1992 was partly at the instigation of the UN was to announce that he was going to leave office and hand over power. Then to actually not that many people surprise, including even his, except that it was so fast, everybody changed sides because who wants to be the last person to be defending, um, it, particularly if you're, and to get killed and to then essentially um, be held and your family's also re held unless you can actually um, change sides. And that is what happened. If, you, if your great defenders have, have signaled that they're going to desert you, they're going to change sides. So nobody should really have been surprised by that. Once it, once it was so clear how comprehensively they were being deserted. I'd like to dig deeper on the degree to which the Taliban has actually changed since that time, since the mid-90s. What do the Taliban want this time around? And will the new Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan look like the old one? Taking a selfie with the Taliban, some Afghans probably see the self-proclaimed holy warriors as liberators from Western soldiers. After the Taliban conquered the country in the 1990s and declared it the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, a 10-year reign of terror followed until an international coalition of troops led by the U.S. overthrew the terrorist regime of Islamists. Now the Taliban are attempting to present themselves as more moderate. Spokesmen have declared an end to the war and are issuing promises that appear to say exactly what Afghans want to hear. 
peace and order for the country. The Taliban are also negotiating with all of the other countries that want to impose their own power and security interests within the region. Among other things, China is interested in the country's raw materials, while Iran, like Pakistan, fears a new influx of refugees, and the West fears the export of Islamist terrorism. But fundamentalists and moderates within the Taliban are waging an internal war for power. Where is Afghanistan headed under the Taliban? And let me put that question straight away to you, Wally. The Taliban are talking about amnesties, diversity, inclusiveness. Is there such a thing as Taliban 2.0, or is this a wolf that has temporarily donned sheep's clothing as a matter of expediency? Well, they are saying that, and we have to watch if they really um, uh, follow that what they are saying. After the takeover of Kabul, the Taliban seem to be conciliatory. They have uh, declared a general amnesty. Nobody should be prosecuted anymore. Men and women should go to their work and offices, and the girls and boys should go back to uh, school uh, with immediate uh, effect. According to the Taliban, they want to form an inclusive government, as uh, uh, you say. Um, that will be uh, acceptable to uh, the international community and all Afghans. But all these, uh, this should be done in accordance with Sharia, according to them. What can be seen, however, is that their fighters find it difficult uh, uh, to react in a conciliatory uh, manner to uh, uh, counter opinions and protests from population, uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Berlin uh, said. So the Taliban have uh, put themselves a mission impossible. Uh, according to me, state building is not their speciality. They are good fighters. Th some of them may be uh, Quran or Islamic uh, scholars, but uh, building a state needs more than only that. Jessica, the Taliban are not monolithic. What do we know about divisions within their ranks and how that could play out in terms of their aims and their actions going forward? Absolutely. It's a very important point. The Taliban is not a single unit. Uh, we tended over the last 20 years to call anyone who was raising arms against ISAF, against the NATO military presence in Afghanistan, as Taliban. But it's much more complicated than that. Afghanistan is a patchwork of multiple different ethnic groups who very frequently do not get along with each other. Um, also, we're dealing with a fighting force made up of predominantly undereducated, even illiterate soldiers who, for the most part, have known nothing in their whole lives but war and poverty. So if you are trying to enforce a chain of command from Kabul, from Doha, to the soldier, the Talib, in the street with a gun who is being, in a certain moment, um, challenged by a civilian or confronted with women doing something that, in their worldview, is against Sharia and is illegal and must be punished immediately, um, there's that, um, that disconnect between the harshness and the brutality of Taliban soldiers and what um, Taliban political spokespeople are saying in Kabul in press conferences, there's a huge gap between the two. And so um, it's an excellent point that was raised earlier that we can't just dismiss the Taliban outright. Um, we, we certainly should not legitimize this government, but we do need to talk. And actually, that's what we needed to do 20 years ago and failed to do. And that's part of what brought us to this situation in the first place. Andrew, within that patchwork that Jessica just described, is there a group or a faction that might justifiably be considered uh, amenable to discussion with the West? You said the West needs to talk to the Taliban. Do you have such a group in mind? No, it's not so much a group, but there are certainly individuals that we know of and are in close contact with. And I think, but we, and I don't think we should be playing um, groups. Oh, this is a good group. This is a bad group. I mean, I think also it'll be a very self-fulfilling prophecy to say talk about return to terror, and, and it's also self-fulfilling if, if you assume they're going to massively discriminate against women and return to amputations and stonings. I, I think we have to in our dealings with them, assume that they have changed, e even if we have obviously a little bit of doubt because we cannot be certain. And of course, what, what is undeniable is that they are more sophisticated. The, the most clear-cut 
example of how they are 2.0 um, is that they are much more sophisticated and they know what we want to hear as well. So we can't therefore be absolutely sure that what we are hearing is, is the true picture, but let us assume that it is going to be and act as if we assume that they are act, acting in good faith and hopefully they can be rewarded for behaving in a good way rather than just being threatened with punishment, which is the gut reaction. Of so while he mentioned that the new government is going to need to have uh, relations with the international community, not least for economic mm -hmm. reasons, but does the West have any leverage at all ever ha after having lost face and credibility with this unbelievable debacle of a withdrawal? Well, it's a very, very good question, Melinda. Of course, they've lost a phenomenal amount of credibility. Um, that's why they have to work all the harder. I think, I think they need to really show, the West needs to show that they are, have not entirely deserted the human rights defenders who have done so much to try to advance that poor country in, in so many different ways, to stand by women educators and many, many other things, and also to provide generous humanitarian assistance. Plus, the fact that if we are generous with asylum, and of course we all know that the political difficulties, not least in this country, but of, of allowing refugees and asylum seekers, but that is also a form of leverage. If the Taliban know that uh, Western countries are going to be generous in doing that, they might be less harsh themselves. And one of the big difficulties, though, right now is that the Taliban does not want to let these people out. The educated class... Um, that upper upper middle class um, of educated Afghans who have been working with NATO, who have been working um, with international aid organizations, with the UN institutions, with the embassies. These are the people, as Wali was mentioning, who would actually be able to run and implement the, a functioning government. And the Taliban is acutely aware that if they have a mass brain drain event right now, that the country will fall apart. And so um, these people are really being held between a rock and a hard place um, will the West stand up for them? Will we find a way to bring our people out into safety? Or I will they be come stuck? come back to that in, in, in just a moment. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We're going to also look at the situation of women. Uh, and, of course, many, of, of, uh, many women are amongst the Absolutely. educated elite. Yeah. But let me first uh, ask you, Wally, let's, let's go back to the question of the Taliban's relations with the international community, if we can call it a community, and how that might influence their behavior. The fact is, back in the 90s, the Taliban did a miserable job of providing jobs, products, services. It's one of the reasons uh, for their downfall at that time. Obviously, they're going to need help to get the economy running, to provide development of any kind. Uh, will that moderate their behavior in any way? Who are they going to be looking to? Well, I think the Taliban themselves know that uh, they can't run the state without foreign aid, without foreign development aid, and I think uh, that uh, can be a leverage uh, uh, on the Taliban, uh, that uh, uh, one can talk to them and that uh, one can talk uh, to them about the uh, um, uh, what they should be doing or what they should not be doing, what they ought not to do. Um, another uh, thing what we know now is that the um, uh, the president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, uh, he is in Emirates and he has not resigned. And he has said yesterday that he wants to return to Kabul. We have the vice president in Panjshir who has said that he will be fighting. And he says after um, Ghani has left, now he is the president, the rightful president of Afghanistan and the son of Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was the commander against uh, the Taliban, uh, uh, resisted who was commanding the resistance. He is also uh, uh, saying that he will not uh, 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 give up the panchir. So that is also something I think the uh, Taliban were not expecting. So uh, 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 it is very important that the West and every side uh, should keep talking and uh, the dialogue um, must go on. It's very, very important. Let's talk about the uh, every side uh, that Wally just mentioned, Andrew, because... Um, if we look at the countries that have been receiving Taliban uh, leaders uh, recently, it's China, it's Iran. Pakistan, of course, gave uh, great uh, support and shelter to the Taliban all these years. Um, what kind of leverage, if any, would you expect them to have over the Taliban's behavior going forward? Well, one thing we can be sure about, and a few other countries too, 
they are greatly enjoying what they're seeing now because uh, the self-inflicted blow to our credibility and the demonstration of Western weakness that has just been shown. So they're not going to do anything, of course, as a favour to us. Uh, but on the other hand, they don't want to see, particularly China, I would say, and, and Russia, they don't want to see a fundamentalist state um, exporting uh, hardline religious um, extremism. So they're, they're going to be, they, they will, on that front, we, we can probably count on them to, to, to do the right thing. So the one thing that definitely might change is that Afghanistan is not likely to once again become a place that harbors terrorism? No, I, I think that I, I would... I think that'd be too... <laughs> uh, we cannot be that sure. Of course, we need to be very, very vigilant. But, but at least those other countries will be trying to... But equally, those countries aren't the ones that made it the base for terrorism in the first place. And let's also remember that the way global terrorist organizations work today is much different than, for, uh, than 20 years ago. All right, when we talk about a ha safe harbor for terrorists, uh, terrorism is also now a decentralized uh, global movement. Groups can coordinate and collaborate and communicate with digital technologies. They're decentralized networks. So having a safe haven, quote unquote, like Osama bin Laden found in Afghanistan in the 90s, um, this is not really the risk that we're facing right now. Um, if we're talking about the risk of terror, what I see here is the desperation, the poverty, the bloodshed, the brutality, because terror grows where desperation grows. This is the problem. And we have just turned Afghanistan into almost a more miserable situation than it was in 20 years ago because we opened the door, we created this hope and this opportunity for change, and now, mm -hmm. literally in the course of a day, it slammed shut. I want to pick up on that. Uh, the Taliban claim that things will be different this time, saying that they want to create an inclusive government that won't threaten the West nor support violence against women. But girls and women fear the freedoms and opportunities that they gained over the past 20 years will soon end. The Taliban came to mosques and they told everyone that their fighters will marry off widows and young girls. They said that their fighters will marry off two out of three daughters in every family. We got scared and left. The Taliban killed my husband and my son. Four of my children and I fled the fighting. We have been staying here since yesterday evening. We have nothing back home. Our home was bombed. I'm not afraid of them. We are not the people who will, you know, go back to the dark era. I'm a girl and I don't care about anyone, not Pakistan, not America, nobody else. I'm here even today. If they kill me, if they identify me, I will not care about them. Jessica, the Taliban say they will allow girls to go to school. They will allow women to work within the bounds of Sharia law. So very briefly, if you would, what does that mean and what do we owe to those women we've just heard from whose hopes we have raised over the past 20 years? We have no reason to trust the Taliban to keep this word. And under the laws of Sharia, what is that supposed to mean? Their interpretation of Sharia will be different from elsewhere in the Muslim world. The long and short of it is we cannot trust them to protect the rights of women and girls or of any men and boys who wish to live freely. And right now, the international community has one responsibility, especially all NATO member states who participated in this mission. We went in together, we need to leave together, and we need to do everything we can with the support of the American military and the power of the NATO diplomatic community to get our Afghan staff and colleagues and friends and the people who have fought with us side by side, whether as journalists or interpreters, to get them out of the country. Well, the Taliban have actually become very savvy about digital communications. A Taliban spokesman this week gave an interview to a woman anchor whose face was visible, not necessarily something you might have seen uh, 20 years ago. Could the this new media savviness exert an influence also over the Taliban's behavior in the sense of pressure even via online social media? 
but we have to differ is uh, that what is the, the the things that the speaker of Taliban is telling and the facts the fact is that their fighters many tens of thousands they expect uh, their leaders to uh, uh, apply sharia in afghanistan and if those hopes are not fulfilled i think the leaders will have a problem on the other side the other afghans especially living in the large cities as well as uh, as well as the international community expect them to be moderate so uh, it will be very really difficult for taliban uh, especially for the leaders uh, to find a midway which is acceptable for both sides but one thing uh, that uh, most of the afghans are uh, united at is that all of them are muslims and uh, the other thing is that the most afghans they don't <coughs> want war they are tired of war and they don't okay. want external intervention. So Thank you. I think... Um yeah, thank you very much. I want to give the last word to Andrew. The young girl at the end of our report, Andrew, made it clear that she is ready to stand up for her rights. What would you say as an expert on conflict mediation and dialogue? What would you say to the women of, of Afghanistan today? I, I would say that, look, we are going to do everything possible to, to support you. And that is an incredibly important message that we have to give to the Taliban as well, that we are ready to stand by the women and the human rights defenders. That is both morally correct and politically expedient as well. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us for this discussion. And thanks to all of you for joining in. See you soon.